We've almost made it. Last talk of the day. Um, so uh, I don't have any grand solutions or super slick technology to show you today, but I do think I have an interesting story to share with you. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, tell the story by tying together a few different ideas. So uh, I, have a I have a mountain biking problem. I love mountain biking and uh, big, mountain, big mountain loops in the backcountry. I love going on road trips with my buddies, doing mountain bike vacations. A few years ago, I went on a mountain bike vacation uh, with three of my friends in uh, Durango, Colorado. And uh, what we wanted to do for our last big ride, we wanted to ride from the Purgatory Resort, also known as the Durango Mountain Resort, and ride over to the Colorado Trail and then take the Colorado Trail down into Durango. And, but the problem that we had was we couldn't find any maps of the trails connecting the backside of the Purgatory Resort to the Colorado Trail. So we ended up running into this guy who knew the local trails and he had a piece of receipt paper in his truck and a pen and he drew us a map, and added some inf information to it so we headed off with that piece of receipt paper into the back country. And uh, of course, we, we ran into problems. We got to a, we got to a fork in the trail, and one of the, the, at the fork, one trail went down one drainage, the other trail went down another drainage. And uh, so we had a 50-50 chance. We decided to take it. Long story short, we went down the wrong drainage. And uh, so we ended up spending the night, a 35-degree night, out. Uh, at 10,500 feet with no fire, no clothes, no food, no water. And so we ended up spooning together. Um, <laughs> we did. We were spooning together. My spooning partner was nicknamed the Filth. That was his real nickname. <laughs> and I can tell you that he came by that nickname honestly. He stunk. <laughs> and so I don't know whether it was his fumes or the hypothermia that we all experienced. But I had a vision that night, a vision of the <laughs> ultimate solution to our predicament. This was really the eureka moment for Juicy Trails. And uh, I thought, well, this pro we probably would run into this problem. We were on public trails. We wouldn't have run into this problem had there been, wouldn't it be neat if there were some trail signs that had a map on them? And better yet, wouldn't it be great if those trail signs had some map codes that you could use to download that map onto your phone and then follow it when you're out in the backcountry. So that was really the Eureka idea that led to Juicy Trails. Um, and the, the basic ideas behind Juicy Trails are really simple. Um, the first idea was that if, you know, I figured if I wanted it, other people probably wanted it too. And the thing that I want most out of a trail map app is, and the thing that's most important to me and to my safety and also to the fun factor is for the trail coverage to be comprehensive and accurate. That is the most important thing. And the second idea is that in order to create a comprehensive trail map on a large scale for like the areas that I like to visit, um, I realized that it would require a collaborative community effort to build those kinds of maps and so I really think it's best that those kinds of maps are built with open data. It's the only way, I think, to produce uh, collaborative projects necessary uh, to create comprehensive maps. So I live in Crested Butte, Colorado. Crested Butte's a really special place. Um, it's in the middle of the state. It's at the end of the road. And it's surrounded by uh, national forest and wilderness areas. It's also surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of miles of trails. In my opinion, the best mountain biking trails on earth, that's why I live there. Um, and so, I forget what my next slide is. So, um, the, um, so until recently, around Crested Butte, there were no, uh, really, hardly any trail signs out on all these hundreds of miles of trails. And there were also really no great maps that were comprehensive and completely accurate. And this is causing a lot of problems for people that visit, Crest, visit Crested Butte, um, and also people who live there. 
Uh, so for, exa for example, there's a lot of, use there were, and there's still to some level, a lot of user conflicts. You know, motorcyclists riding on mountain bike trails, mountain bikers riding on hiking trails. Um, it was also, there's been a lot of trespassing issues that the ranchers were concerned about, people wandering onto their private lands, leaving gates open, cattle getting out. Um, and also people get lost, which is a real problem. People die uh, in, that, in our area of the country. Just last week, a lady hiked up Mount Crested Butte, went off the trail a little bit, not exactly sure why, but she fell 150 feet to her death. This was last week. And last year, a lady died out in the back country, and they presumably think because she was following an inaccurate map. She had it on her person when they found her eight months later. So um, the community stakeholders were like, well, we've got to do something about this. And so the Forest Service didn't have money to really do anything about the trail signage problem, and so the Gunnison Crested Butte Tourism Association decided they would foot the bill for a trail map, uh, trail signage initiative. And so um, the, the problem was that all the trail, all the necessary data to build a comprehensive trail map was in different people's pots, and these pots didn't share very nicely with each other. Um, and so, you know, like the Forest Service had its own data, uh, the town of Crested Butte had its own, Gunnison County had its own data, and even the trail associations had little pots of data, but they couldn't figure out how to collaborate together. So I made a very simple suggestion, why don't we build the map using open street maps? Oh, one point that I wanted to make here is that the selling point for building the map with OpenStreetMap was that I told them that not only will you get accurate trail data out of it, uh, everybody else in the world who's using OpenStreetMap to build their mobile trail maps will also have great data for their maps. And they were like, sold. So we used the Juicy Trails platform and we, bu we built the Crested Butte Gunnison Trails web application. Um, and I didn't mention this before, but the GC Trails web application and the CBG Trails app, it's a single web application platform that serves on the back end as a mapping platform and on the front end as the mobile trail map app. So on the mapping platform side, you can map trails, you can create routes, you can add them to mobile maps that work offline, um, and then you can create embeds to share on websites and you can also share all that content to social media. So the very first task, of course, was to build the trail map. And so we used the OSM ID editor, customized just a little bit for juicy trails. Um, so it includes all the standard features you might be familiar with, um, and also the uh, um, juicy trails map style, and the Strava heat map, and the slide tool. So I'm sure most of y'all are probably already familiar with the Strava heat map. Um, what Strava does is it collects GPS data from its users and makes it available as a open resource so people can use it to map stuff like trails. In my opinion, it's the best thing that's happened to trail mapping ever, other than OpenStreetMap itself. It's wonderful. Um, I hope Strava, Strava keeps it going. So here we're looking at a Bing satellite imagery, the Strava heat map. I'll just give you, you guys know how mapping works, but I'm just gonna play this real quick. So you just draw a vector line, roughly trace it in, use the slide tool to align the vector line to the Strava heat map, and then you just tag it, highway equals path, give it a name. You guys know how this works, bicycles equals yes. And uh, give it a commit message, and Juicy Trail server picks it up and shows it in the map. You guys are probably all really familiar with that. Um, but it, well, I'm not going to get into that. I don't have time. So the one small thing that makes Juicy Trails unique is that, and I'll show you this in a minute, is that the um, Juicy Trails uses uh, line colors to illustrate which activities are permitted on a given trail. Um, so for example, highway path equals a uh, red line. Uh, if you give it, uh, an, a path can be either a paved trail or unpaved trail, so if you add the surface tag, it changes it to a magenta line, showing you that it's a hiking trail. 
If you add horse equals yes, it gives you a purple line, so on and so forth. Really simple stuff. So we did this and um, we worked with all the community stakeholders, the Forest Service, Gunnison County, the Trail Associations, and the Town of Crested Butte, and we mapped the area together. And um, we followed a very simple strategy. I'll share with you. So our first, the first thing we decided to do is just go through and map everything highway equals path. Gave it no tags. So after we did that, we worked collectively to add the appropriate tags to the map. And again, this is not rocket science. Um, but in the end, what you get is one multi-user map. And at the, end of the other end of the pipe, this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, this, is, this is just uh, a quarter of the trails in Crested Butte. Um, so the green trails are the motorcycle trails, the dark orange trails are hiking horse and bike trails, the purple ones are hiking only trails. So in addition to creating the mobile map, we're also making the trail signs, also built with OpenStreetMap data. And uh, these trail signs are going up all over the forest uh, at every major trail intersection. It's a huge project. Um, and <coughs> the trail signs have map download codes on them, so when you walk up to the sign, you can load the, f the map onto your phone, and it works offline. So, and we're also making uh, kiosks that are going up everywhere. And visitors love this. This has been a huge hit, because if you've never been to Crested Butte before, you can walk up to a trailhead kiosk, look at a big map, download it to your phone, and go out to the back country with greater confidence, right? And you can probably also have more fun. People really like this a lot because not only does it make, give them more confidence, I think it enhances their user experience quite a bit. So the trail associations are using CBG trails, map embeds, and putting them on their website so they can tell their trail users where to go. So this is Gunnison Trails, um, example of a map embed. And uh, the Crested Butte Mountain Bike Association is developing, in the middle of developing a new website. They're taking a little step further, and they're creating recommended rides. There's like 33 recommended rides, rides that the locals do. And that you can do too just by going to their website. And if you look at the website on a mobile device, you can download that map and follow it right to your phone, right from the website. So the, it's been a huge hit. Uh, the, Everyone from the executive director of the Mountain Bike Association to the uh, director of uh, community and economic development of Gunnison County, and of course the executive director of the Gunnison Crested Butte Tourism Association. Everybody has little different reasons why they like it. Um, the, Gun the Gunnison Crested Butte Tourism Association views it as a, ve as a marketing vehicle uh, to increase uh, 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 trail user visitations, and trail user tourism to the valley, but also they view it as a way to enhance people's experience once they get there. So in addition to like the CBG Trails app being, you know, pretty successful, uh, the, the data itself is, is somewhat of a small success and it's had a, provided a lot of benefits that we didn't even really anticipate. Um, so, uh, so this is Hillary Henry she is the director of the Gunnison Public Lands Initiative. And um, she gave me a call one day and she said, Derek, I'm having a real, she's creating a, a master plan uh, for the Gunnison Public Lands in the area. They want to take it to Congress. They needed trail data, track data for their master plan. She was having a really hard time finding the data because nobody had all the data in one pot. And she was like, Derek, can you, can you somehow, somehow, share the data with me. I was like, well, can you mash a button? If you go to Geofabric, you'll find a Colorado shapefile has everything you need. And so very quickly, she was able to pull down that data and put it in her master plan. This makes a big difference. It saves people a lot of time, makes their plans a whole lot better. So we thought this was, you know, we finished the C CBG Trails project, the first wave of it, we're still in, into it. 
We finished the first wave of it last August. We sort of thought, well, so maybe we could start serving more of these kinds of projects. Sort of thought we were off to the races. And uh, so I ended up having a lot of conversations with different kinds of organizations from communities to counties to the state of Colorado to the federal government. And all the conversations went about exactly the same way, and you guys might uh, suspect how the conversations went. Um, so uh, one of the conversations I had sort of illustrates all of them. I had a really great conversation with the uh, director of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Office, the GIS director, and he was charged by Governor Hickenlooper, oh, he was charged by Governor Hickenlooper to um, create an interactive map of trails of Colorado. And so it's a great idea. It's a really great project. Uh, I really admire the decision a lot. Um, but what the, so when I was talking to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Director, I asked him, well, how are you doing it? So what they're doing is they're calling every community, every land manager in the community, and they're manually sending them their data so they can build a closed database of, to, so they can produce this interactive map. And I said, well, what's your ultimate goal? He said, well, ultimately, when we're done, we want to make it available to the public. And I was like, well, there might be an easier way. Um, have you thought about using OpenStreetMaps? And he said, well, no. Uh, well, actually, yes, but we can't do it. And I said, why is that? And he said, because we're afraid of rogue trail mapping. That's a, and that's, that's the answer almost every community gives. They will not adopt OpenStreetMap because they fear rogue trail mapping. And no amount of talking I can do can, can convince them that that is largely, not always, but largely a myth. Because if you care about secret trails, if you're a person who cares about secret trails, the last thing you want to do is publish your secret trail in OpenStreetMaps and make it available for the world to see. Um, so, I'm going to backpedal here real quick. I've got just a few more minutes. Um, so uh, in my former life, um, I was a behavioral neuroscientist and gen geneticist. And um, through my own, re and I, went into the, I went into basic research because I wanted to do something for the public good, right? And um, through my own research and through the research of others, it became obvious to me, may not be obvious to everyone, that we would never create a pill that's more effective at improving uh, human physical and mental health as exercise in the outdoors. And recent research is, is, is bearing this to be true. So, you know, exercise in the, in the outdoors increase, enhances new neuronal growth in the hippocampus. Uh, physical activity is uh, linked to uh, Brain act, spontaneous brain activity associated with improved cognition. And this is a really interesting article. Nature, simply the act of being out in nature for a period of time has a positive effect on a person's mood over and above the effect of exercise alone. So clearly, that's, that's a great way. Two minutes. All right. So... Yes, I'll say this. I was reticent to share this story, but I'm going to share it with you. So before uh, graduate school, I worked in a bike shop, and we built, me and the guys in the bike shop built a bunch of secret trails in the Carolina North Forest. And, um, and uh, let's see, short way to tell this story. So, so uh, the, the University of North Carolina planned to build a uh, north campus in this forest, and we tried our darndest to keep the trails secret, but when the Carolina, Carolina went to public hearings to show the town members its plan, droves of people showed up in protest, almost shut the operation down. And they were really upset because the university was going to build trails in the forest and, you know, effectively ruin the forest. And so um, the basic lesson that I draw from this is that when users use trails, guess what happens? You get more trails. And you see that, and you hear that from many stories all across the country. And so uh, the, the idea that wraps this together is that, um, you know, not that good trail maps feed into this loop 
of users using trails. And when users use trails, you get more trails because I believe that better trail maps, more accurate trail maps will give people greater confidence to get in the outdoors and use trails more. And when they use trails more, you get more trails. So I think good maps have a, have a role there. So um, a few weeks ago, I got really frustrated and uh, made a perhaps a rash de decision. We decided to split our company. Uh, we are, instead of trying to uh, ask and ask and ask if we can you know, help communities make trail maps, uh, we decided we would turn Juicy Trails into Go Maps, and that's gonna be the third party app developer. Juicy Trails is gonna become its own standalone app, and our goal is to help comp comprehensively map all the trails in the US. Um, if you look at the state of trail mapping in the US, it's pretty easy to see the state when you look at the Juicy Trails map. Um, trail mapping has progressed rapidly in the past couple years. Already, uh, the OpenStreetMap data allows you to build the most comprehensive maps in many areas of the country. It's, um, it's really astounding how quickly it's growing. And so, um, you know, I don't have a solution or a sweet piece of technology that's gonna, you know, allow me to wave, wave a magic wand and make all this happen. Uh, but I think it is very possible for us as a community to get from the state where uh, trail mapping is now to a point where all the trails in the US are comprehensively mapped. I don't know exactly how to do it. I have some ideas. Um, but I do know from my experience that the only way that we're going to be able to do it, and of course, you know, I'm in a receptive audience here, uh, but the only way that we're going to be able to do it effectively on such a large scale is if we uh, collaborate as a community with OpenStreetMaps. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a, a couple minutes for questions. Nice job. Oh. Um, go Maps. Uh, you know there's a Go Map. It's GoMaps.us. Okay. <laughs> we, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, I think, uh, it wasn't I that made that decision. It was the developer probably in the middle of the night when he was working. <laughs> Yeah, so just so you're aware that it, that's the most popular um, editor for um, OpenStreetMap. Yeah, I met the developer for that, and that, yep. is a, that is a great app. Yeah, okay, but keep, keep at it. Okay, keep Go Maps is a third-party app developer. We're not, it's, it's not gonna be its own standalone app. Okay. Uh, before I take the next question, I'll just let you all know that the closing session um, is, starts at 5.30 in this room, so just stay here. I have a question. Uh, I'm a three, I'm a park employee. So, if, uh, if uh, difficult to find the park, looking for bike, uh, ski, in Colorado, if you look in search database, if a ski, uh, automatic way to get park. In database, easier to get. Geocoding, geocoding will work. Geocoding and accuracy. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm sorry. I, geocoding I don't. will help. So, so you're saying you think geocoding will help in the accuracy of the, of the trail map? Well, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I'll talk with you more afterwards. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I was just wondering if you take cell phone coverage into account on uh, the barcodes on the maps that are out on the trails. Yeah, the, you much. know, uh, we tried uh, a while back, not with this project, to use uh, barcodes, QR codes. Yeah. Uh, that, that's not a reliable method. So we just have uh, people type in a text code into the app. Well, that's, that's true. Yes, you, you do have to have uh, internet connection to download the map, but once they're downloaded, they work offline. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a great idea. Thank you. Derek, we have another question for you. Hi, friends. So amateur mountain biker and pretty bad hiker, but this would be super helpful for me. Um, I have a question about the spatial accuracy of multiple sources. So how do you determine a low level of accuracy? And is there a way that you can review a trail and actually throw it out if it's inaccurate? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the, the level of accuracy, I've, you know, it's determined by the Strava heat map, really. Um, and because uh, we align all of our trail data to the Strava heat map in most cases. Um, and I found that to be the most accurate way to geo-reference trails. It's, it's far superior to er other things that I've tried. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm also a, an avid user of slide to map mountain bike trails. Here in Washington State, we have some really dense areas. So there's like a, maybe it's like a two acre plot that right. has like 10 trails that get super tight. Uh -huh. Do you have any recommendations for how to tease that out? Because well, on, on the Strava heat map, basically it looks like a blue blob. Yeah, um, I th you know, in those kinds of situations, it's better if you have like an individual GPS track that you can reference. And there's ways to, you know, get those. Um, of course, the best way is to go collect it yourself. Yeah. Does it go? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is that it? All right. Thank you very much. Oh, there's one more question. Um, have you worked? Have you worked at all with um, mapping winter recreation where the, tr like for instance, a ski resort that has trails out during the summer, but, uh, or mountain biking during the summer, but skiing in the winter? Uh, yeah, we've tinkered with it. Uh, we haven't uh, conducted a real project trying to do that yet, but there's um, 55 kilometers of uh, Nordic trails around Crested Butte. And skiing is off the chain. Um, and uh, yeah, we've tinkered with it, and uh, actually, that's all. That's all in the OpenStreetMap database. And we'll please provide Derek with a warm thank you for his presentation. Oh.